My name is Emily Horrell-Mauer, and I would like to welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Pottstown. This morning, I am grateful to everyone who managed to make it out here on this slightly gray day, and I am very also happy to see that we have a Zoom person. Hi, CJ. This morning, we're carving out sacred space in our hearts and in our homes and in this sacred space so that we can gather and be together in spirit and in body. We have music played by the lovely Carly Shell, and we have Mr. Rick Dusky on the tech back there. Thank you so much. For over 50 years, the UUFP has been a liberal religious voice in the Pottstown area. As we believe, as you use, we believe that reason and wonder can coexist, that we can honor the teachings of those who've gone before, even as we explore into the future, and that no one is outside the circle of justice and compassion. We hope today that your spirit and your heart and your mind are all refreshed as we commit ourselves once again to our seven guiding principles. We come together this Sunday morning and every Sunday morning, not because we share a creed, but because we share a promise to support one another on our spiritual journey. Our services are different every week, but the loving kindness we offer one another here remains the same. So whoever you are, wherever you are, whenever you are, whomever you love, we're glad you chose to see us. So now we have a moment for Sunday service next week for Memorial Day weekend, so there is no Sunday service. words this morning, we have a selection from Langston Hughes. This is actually not the one that you'll see in the back of the um, gray mail. This is a 
different one, actually, out here. Dreamkeeper. Bring me all of your dreams, you dreamers. Bring me all of your heart melodies, that I may wrap them in blue cloud cloth away from the two rough fingers of the world. And now we will share in hymn number 41, which is You That Have Spent the Silent Night. Now this is one that is not a particularly familiar hymn. I'm sorry, everyone. I actually have two unfamiliars and one familiar, so it's going to be fun for everybody. Her grandparents said, oh, 
oh, oh, I'm sorry we misheard you. But we wouldn't have bought you a corpus anyhow. They belong in the sea. Well, Amira was fuming. Why had no one understood her when she wanted a porpoise? And now that she thought about it, why were the adults so unwilling to give her a purpose either? What was a purpose anyway? Well, Amira set about finding a purpose. Over the next several years, she asked a lot of adults she knew and trusted, and some of the adults said, mm, I don't know, that's a really hard thing to explain. But some of the adults gave her good ideas. They said, pay attention to the things you care about and how you can use those things to make a difference in the world. You may not have a clear idea about it yet, but your purpose will certainly change over time. And if you think about the things you value and how you can use those things for good, you'll be on the right track. So Amira thought about the things she valued and cared about. Things like animals and the habitats they live in. Things she liked to do, things like learning new things and teaching those things to other kids. She thought about her heroes, people who were living their lives in ways that she wanted to copy. And she thought about what was possible and how she could change the world when she was older. And eventually, after time and work, Amira came up with her purpose. And her purpose was porpoises. She decided she was going to be a caring advocate for the earth and teach others about conservation. So that's what she did. forgotten my dream. But it was there then in front of me, bright like a sun. My dream. And then the wall rose. Rose slowly, slowly, between me and my dream. Rose slowly, slowly, dimming, hiding the light of my dream. Rose until it touched the sky, that wall. Shadow. I'm black, I lie down in the shadow. 
No longer the light of my dream before me, above me. Only the thick wall. Only the shadow. My hands, my dark hands, break through the wall. Find my dream. Help me to shatter this darkness. Smash this night. Break the shadow into a thousand lights of sun. Into a thousand whirling dreams of sun. Hymn number 37, God Who Fills the Universe. <clears throat> Sorry, it's also on. one that I have to like actually watch when I'm trying to fit my focus between this <laughs> and that. <laughs> Doesn't work out so hot. Dream a little dream. Last night I dreamed I was in a children's hospital watching a famous doctor design physical therapy for a child prodigy viola player who also happened to be his granddaughter. She had hand surgery and was going to do physical therapy in the online world of Animal Crossing. Okay, so in my family we have a rule about sharing dreams. You have to be able to summarize them in three sentences or less, and only if someone asks can you share additional details. So when you remember a dream and you share it, you are experiencing a vivid, full-color memory. It's full of detail. But to the person listening to your dream, it's like hearing somebody describe a mid-season episode of a long-running TV show that your subscription service doesn't even carry, so you can't watch it anyhow. Hmm, sometimes it's mildly, mildly interesting, but there's no chance you're gonna become a regular viewer. We don't know exactly why dreams are important, but we know that they are. Everybody <laughs> But there is a certain proportion of people that is not predisposed to remembering their dreams. I heard a story on the radio once about a person who was convinced that he never dreamed. And he went to a sleep researcher, and they woke him up in the middle of the night, and he was amazed. He had been having a dream, and he had never remembered a dream before. <coughs> it makes me wonder what his sleep was like and how that could have ever happened. I'm on the far opposite side of that spectrum. I consistently remember my dreams. Dreams, it turns out, are more likely to happen during certain times of night. When we go to sleep, we don't just lie still for several hours until our bodies have rebooted. Our brains and our bodies go through several different types of sleep, from light sleep to deep sleep to a special state called REM sleep. Jane Summer, a staff writer for the Sleep Foundation, writes in her 2022 article, What is REM Sleep and How Much Do You Need? That REM sleep was first noticed, that, noticed by researchers studying infants in the 1950s. They noticed that during certain periods of sleep, the infant's eyes would move around quickly behind their eyelids. And 
so they called this stage of sleep REM for those rapid eye movements. She goes on to say that REM sleep is important for dreaming, emotional processing, memory, and brain development. Chris Soriano at SciComm.net writes in her 2022 article, REM sleep, what it is and why it matters. Is there anyone who doesn't just title theirs REM sleep, what it is, why it matters? Um, she writes that REM sleep is the part of sleep that is most likely to affect dreams, although you can actually dream during other parts of sleep as well. Um, but she thinks that it may be an evolutionary protective measure, ensuring that we're periodically alert to external threats because you're much more able to be woken up during REM sleep than you are in any of the other stages of sleep. For example, in deep sleep, your breathing and your heart rate and your body temperature and even your brainwave activity are all very low and very slow. But by contrast, during REM sleep, your breathing and your heart rate and your brain waves are more closely related to your waking patterns. Soriano's article quotes Dr. Jalstein Chapwal, director of Mood Program at Sierra Tucson, who says, REM sleep is a paradox, because even though it's a stage of sleep, your brain is wide awake. All of this is to say that sleeping and dreaming are essential human behaviors. Dreaming is mandatory. If we lock ourselves out of dreamland, we cannot be at our best. You know, even dolphins and porpoises, they will dream, they will sleep. They, it's really interesting because they don't sleep, they don't have as much REM sleep as um, regular, as other non-aquatic mammals, because if they do actually sleep altogether, they will die. They have to breathe consciously so they can suffocate in their sleep. So they have REM sleep, but they only have one half of their brain off at a time. So another interesting sleep thing that just came out, like either this week or last week, spiders may experience REM sleep. So Julian Mark from the Washington Post writes, one night in September 2020, um, researcher Rossler came home and noticed that some jumping spiders she had collected and placed in boxes on her windowsill were hanging upside down from their silk lines, very much like little tiny Christmas tree ornaments. I was like, well, I don't know what they're doing, but they're hanging really neatly and super exposed, and it's not a silk retreat. So let's film them through the night and see if we can figure it out. And that's what they did. And what she and her fellow researchers saw amazed them. Using an infrared camera, they observed the young Agartra acarata jumping spiders, and they, those jumping spiders experienced bouts of limb twitching when they hung upside down. And because the spiders had translucent exteriors, they could also see their interior retinal tubes, the part of the eye that allows the arachnids to shift their gaze, and they could see that their retinal tubes were shifting and moving and they shake rapidly during a state of apparent inactivity. This did not happen when spiders were active. What? One of the things I found most interesting about this article is that until now, we humans have not even been aware that spiders could sleep. Now we have a scientific inkling that spiders can dream. And they also think that spiders may dream in vibration unlike people, because they, they have all those sensor hairs, so they may actually get inputs that we've never heard of. So a spider's dream might be something that we couldn't even conceive of. And so, you know, now we know that people have nightmares about spiders, and spiders might have nightmares about people. But as far as science is concerned, the only way that we know that humans can dream is by asking them. And since we can't ask any non-human animals about their dreams, we have to assume that non-human animals are not dreaming until we can prove that they are. Well, trying to prove that was taking me down a rabbit hole of things that we try to show are exceptionally human until we find that they're not. For example, the ability to feel pain was once assumed to be a purely human trait. 
and not just purely human, but purely adult humans. Babies were not considered to have um, nervous systems that were developed enough to feel pain. Just because they couldn't say ouch, they could only scream, so obviously their screaming does not mean pain. The ability to feel emotions like anger or sadness was once assumed to be only for humans. We used to think that only humans could communicate with one another. We used to think that only humans could solve problems, that only humans could use tools, but nope, and nope, and also nope. Humans are not as exceptional as we would like to be. We keep trying to carve ourselves a place that's a little bit above the rest of the world, but it turns out we are irrevocably a part of nature as well. But back to dreams. Dreams have always been considered important. The Wikipedia entry on oniromancy, which is divination based on dreams, lists evidence of dreams being recorded and interpreted and acted upon as far back as Gudea, the king of the ancient Sumerian city-state of Lagash, in 2144 BC. He rebuilt an entire temple based on a dream. In ancient Egypt, people believed that dreams brought messages from the gods. And anyone who grew up with a Judeo-Christian background may be familiar with the story of Joseph in the Bible, the technicolor dream coat. I'm actually familiar with him because of Andrew Lloyd Webber, but you know. It's the story of a man who dreamed his way from slavery to prosperity in ancient Egypt and saved a whole country from famine due to his interpretations of the Pharaoh's dreams. Great thinkers Aristotle and Plato discussed prophetic dreams, and there was an entire dream interpretation book written by a scholar Artemidorus in the second century AD, which survives all the way till today. Thank you, Wikipedia, for that information. There's evidence of dream interpretation all around the world from practically every culture. So when we dream, what are we dreaming of? When we're awake, we often say we're dreaming of a better tomorrow. But I am betting that neither you nor I think a better tomorrow involves being on the wrong level of a parking garage and accidentally driving your car through the airport. Or standing on the back of an alligator who helpfully lifts you toward the low swinging ladder of your treehouse. Okay, so maybe our dreams are not building a better tomorrow. But what are they doing? In the abstract for a study called Optimization of the NICU Environment, Richard J. Martin mentions that from 28 weeks of gestation onward, fetuses have periods of REM sleep. Similar patterns occur in preterm infants. So prior to that 28-week 20, gestational age mark, their sleep is, continued, is considered indeterminate, where it could be awake, it could be asleep, and you don't really know. There's not a very good way to tell. But after that 28-week period, their sleep patterns are defined into non-REM and REM patterns. <coughs> and he goes on to describe the ways that REM sleep is important for brain development, including the capacity for learning and processing of auditory stimuli. They actually did, I'm assuming, rat studies where they um, were able to prove that if you're not sleeping enough in your gestational period, that it actually can affect the brain volume as you grow up. Just another thing to worry about as a parent. <laughs> WebMD says that babies spend as much as 50% of their sleep in REM sleep, as compared to adults who spend an average of 20% in REM sleep. In an excerpt from Reference Model of Neuroscience and Behavioral Psychology by D. Kuyken, REM deprivation studies, those are sleep studies where people are just woken up every time they hit REM sleep. They found that people have a more difficult time learning complex skills when they don't have adequate REM sleep. So REM sleep is associated with dreaming and with memory consolidation. So when you think about babies having a lot more REM sleep than adults, it makes total sense because babies are learning everything all the time. And as adults, we're kind of operating on autopilot, except for some pretty, like, oh, I have to learn this specific thing for this specific reason. But babies are just learning everything for no reason. So, if you often remember your dreams, you may find that your dreams visit similar locations on multiple occasions. Maybe your 
our dreams are helping our brains to create an, a memory palace. So if you've ever heard of memory palaces, um, there was a sixth century BC poet, Simonides. Um, Simon, Simonides? I'm not sure. He's credited with creating a technique of associating facts to be remembered with images mentally placed in a well remembered location. So it's a memory palace, if anyone has heard of that. So I can't use a memory palace because you have to hold an image of the place you are in your head along with an image of whatever it is you're trying to remember in your head at the same time. My brain just won't do that. But I can't deny that there are shopping malls and houses and airports that I visit only in my dreams. So maybe I'm visiting them to store facts and stories and procedures and routines of the day in a memory palace that I don't recognize. All right, do you guys want to do an experiment with me? This is kind of fun. We're going to do a short meditation on dreaming. So everyone close your eyes, take a deep breath. Now think of a dream. It doesn't have to be the dream you had last night. It can be any dream that you choose. Now put yourself back in that dream. What did it look like in the dream? What colors did you see? What sounds did you hear? Did your dream smell like something? your dream in just two or three sentences, what would you say about that dream? All right, now comes the tough part. And it's tough not because we need to think deeply about it, but because thinking deeply will probably confuse the message. What is that impression what your dream is saying to you. All right, I'm gonna give you guys a chance to share your dream, but you will not. So the Protestant Reformation was very influential in American culture. Many of our earliest settlers came to America seeking religious liberty. And one of the hallmarks of many of those Protestant sects that settled in what's now the US is a focus on the rewards of hard work and earning God's love through determined striving, striving toward working, striving toward being living a sin-free life, striving towards heaven. You can see this influence if you look up inspirational quotes about dreams. You'll see things like, all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. Walt Disney. Follow your dreams, they know the way. Kobe Yamada. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Eleanor Roosevelt. A dream doesn't become reality through magic. It takes sweat, determination, and hard work. Colin Powell. But those dreams are like a myriad porpoise, sorry, purpose. Those are the dreams that our waking mind determines. Those are the dreams we have to go searching for, that we have to struggle to achieve. And once achieved, we have to show one another and show ourselves that we deserve them. The dreams we have at night are not dreams we have to run to or run after. They're dreams that come seeking us. Our nighttime dreams are more like what Van Gogh described when he said, I dream of painting, and then I paint my dream. And actually, I find that comforting. I like the idea that a dream is something you can experience as ephemeral and let go. I like the idea that a dream is not work, but rest. We all deserve the chance to rest. It's part of our inherent worth and dignity as 
thinking, feeling creatures. It's one of the many strands of the interconnected web of life that makes us like birds and dogs and porpoises and spiders. Just like a lack of food or water or air can kill us, we can die from lack of rest. So enjoy your dreams. Enjoy your sleep. Enjoy your journey to that undiscovered country behind your eyelids. God waits for us there, too. Join me in singing Mysterious Presence, Source of All. <coughs> this one is actually familiar, everyone, so it's not going to be as much of a struggle. Reynolds reminds us, may love permeate your every heartbeat, may faith guide your every step, may truth and compassion be your eternal traveling companions, and may a deep abiding spirit rest joyously in your every waking wish and your every resting dream. <laughs> 